Welcome to the Academy of Imperfection, where experts in their field share their wisdom on the subject of imperfection. Today, best-selling author Johan Hari explains how our focus is being stolen from us. If you're struggling to pay attention, it's not your fault, you're not imagining it. This is happening to almost all of us. And your attention didn't collapse, your attention's been stolen from you. So join students Hugh, Ryan and Josh for the Academy of Imperfection. Well, it, it's the, the day has come. And and look, we've we've been very excited for this day. Uh, we always look. I, I know we always say we're excited. We always say, and I don't want to become the podcast that says they're excited all the time, and then you start hearing us say that, and then you stop believing us. We're we're always excited. We're genuinely very <laughs> excited to have Johan Hari here today. <laughs> we've spoken to Johan before. Before we had the what we call Johan the Academy of Imperfection, which is um, <laughs> the format of this episode. Johan, thank you so much for being here. I'll, I'll let Hugh do properly introduce you because he's way better than that at that than I am. Oh, I'm I'm not at all. But I, Johan, this is huge for us because your your first book, Lost Connection. Well, your second book, Lost Connection. We uh, we chatted about on our podcast, and it and it the response was just unbelievable. I mean. It was very life-changing for a lot of people. I want to read you very quickly uh, an Instagram message I received, and I think I sent this to you, I can't remember, but uh, I received this message straight after our episode came out last time we had you on. The message is a very quick one. It just said, G'day, Hugh, Ryan, and Josh. I've just spent the last hour and a half riding up and down the same streets of Fitzroy North listening to your podcast with Johan Hari. You have just saved my life. Thank you. Which was a deeply moving message to get. But God, I think that's so moving. it is. But I, I wanted you to hear that just because that's the impact that your last episode and and and, and that book had on so many people. God, you're setting the bar pretty fucking high for this conversation, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, now, like, and now you're just going to tell... give people a reason to remain alive on earth. <laughs> <laughs> last time, last time it was saving lives. This time it's like put your phone away. <laughs> <laughs> Um, exactly, exactly. We'll get that. It's uh there's there's just Thank you for that, by the way. That's really moving. It's so weird that I feel like um we spoke in the before times when yes. you know people could actually you know, I mean I got I was surprised seeing the, the first Qantas flight land in Australia the other day on the news. I was surprised by how choked up I got. Uh, I was it's like fuck I can go to Australia again. I was yeah. so <laughs> excited by the prospect, even though I'm not actually in practice gonna come for like a year. There's something about the world, the rhythm of life returning. Like I've, I've just, like I was saying to you before we came on air, I was just in, I've been spending a lot of the pandemic in Vegas researching a book I'm, I'm working on. And I was in Vegas the other day when it was the day they ended the mask mandate. So you could walk around without masks on for the first time inside the casinos and on the strip. And even though I've got mixed feelings about how quickly they've ended it, and even though I've got like all same people, mixed feelings about Vegas, I was amazed by how moved I got walking around and just thinking, I, I very clearly had this thought, this is the first day since the pandemic began where if you had been in a coma and you had just woken up and you were walking around Las Vegas, you wouldn't know anything had happened. And yeah. I got really choked. It's like life came back, right? So I feel like talking to you guys is That's... life coming back as well. Like, you know, we spoke before and here we are, we yeah. survived, we're it's... talking after. Yeah. There's, there's just, just a quick on that, like that idea of like waking up during a pandemic or after a pandemic. There was a story that yeah. when the, when the um, pandemic just sort of hit America, and it was like once in you know March 2020, and it was with the world realized how serious this was. You know the actor Jared Leto. Of you know, course, he, one of the hottest men to ever live. Exactly. Yes, you took, <laughs> took the words. You right have out no of my idea mouth. how much time. <laughs> you have no idea how much time I've spent thinking about Jared Leto. Right? So, <laughs> great. I, <laughs> I won't describe his face in great detail then, because you know. It. Um, so yes, yeah, so like, Jared Leto. He. Um, he was in a, like a meditation retreat, like a, a a 30 day or whatever meditation retreat where he had no connection to the outside world. It was like, a, it was maybe like for passion or some sort of, some sort of thing. Wow. And he came out of it and like, didn't, didn't, and checked his phone. And before he went in, didn't know what um, coronavirus was, stepped out. Wow. A, and, and then the whole world was like going crazy. It was like, <laughs> he said the experience of that was just like he. There's a tweet that he he tweeted about it, like the moment he came out. He's like, "What's what's COVID nineteen? <laughs> 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 
Um, all right. Well, Johan, so people who don't know, I mean, Hugh, I feel like we need to properly introduce Johan. We're just talking like mates, which we obviously now are. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Johan, I have to say, it's so lovely to hear your voice. And I don't say that as a figure of speech or a turn of phrase. I just, I've been listening to your book over the summer holidays and I just love your voice so much. So it is genuine. Oh. Like, I literally mean that. It's lovely to hear your voice. It is. Johan's oh. books have, he's a, he's a New York Times bestselling author. Um, Lost Connections w- uh, was huge for so many people. Stealing the Scream. Chase, oh, sorry, chasing the chasing Scream. The, yeah. stealing. <laughs> <laughs> stealing the Scream and Chasing Focus. <laughs> <laughs> a model of focus oh. and attention yeah. there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, Yoha, we're so oh. excited to have you here. So your new book, Stolen Focus. Now, when I when I heard this was coming out, I had no idea you were writing this book. Uh, I think it was on social media somewhere. It said, your new book's on the way, Stolen Focus, Why You Can't Pay Attention. It automatically hit a, a raw nerve with me. Well, not a raw nerve, but it just it, it got me. And I, the amount of times in the last year I've noticed myself doing things like I'll go upstairs and I'll get upstairs and go, what am I doing up here? Why did I come up here? <laughs> and I've been thinking, I've genuinely been thinking, is this like an early onset of something quite terrifying or is this just what happens when you reach your 40s? Am I, I don't know what's happening here. And so when I saw the title of this book, Stolen Focus, Why You Can't Pay Attention, I was, you, you had me <laughs> very much so. And I, <laughs> when, just, I, when, I when I heard, sorry to cut in, but when I, heard, when I heard that you were writing that book and I saw that front cover you put on Instagram, Johan, I released an audible yes. <laughs> it, it was like, oh, that's what that's what I need to read. But it was, and I was so glad that you were writing it. Sorry, Hugh. To, no, no, that's yeah. okay. Well, oh, I, I I read the you. first I read the first four chapters just before I went on our summer holiday, which was um, we were going away for three and a half weeks, and I was so inspired by the first three chapters that I left every device that I owned at home, and I went away. Wow. And. But, but as I kept reading the book, you, one of the things you said was, absence is not the answer. We don't, that's not going to work. And I remember thinking, well, Johan, you're actually wrong because this is working for me. I've changed. I've, <laughs> I, I don't need this anymore. And now it's February. It's about six weeks later. And I'm probably worse than I was before I went. <laughs> um, right. So there oh. is so much. I mean, you, I think the best way to start is for you to explain your your trip where you did a very similar thing and, ju- and just how this book came to happen, I guess. Yeah, so I've got a godson. I call him Adam in the book. It's not his real name. And when he was nine, he developed this brief but freakishly intense obsession with Elvis. I never understood why. Um, And it was particularly cute because he didn't know that Elvis had become a cheesy cliche. So I think he was the last person in the history of Western (laughs) civilization to do an entirely sincere impression of Elvis Presley. And every night when I tucked him into bed, he would get me to tell him the story of Elvis's life, right? I obviously skipped over the bit at the end where Elvis shits himself to death on the toilet. And and (laughs) one night... I was, as I was tucking him in, I, was, I mentioned Graceland where Elvis lived. And he, he looked at me very intensely and he said, Johan, will you take me to Graceland one day? And I said, yeah, sure. The way you do with nine-year-olds, knowing next week it'll be Legoland. And, and he said, no, no, do you really promise? Do you swear you'll take me to Graceland? And I said, I absolutely promise. And I didn't think of that again for 10 years until... So many things had gone wrong. So he dropped out of school when he was 15. And by the time he was 19, he spent literally almost all his waking hours, that's not an exaggeration, alternating between his iPad and and his phone. And his life was just a kind of blur of WhatsApp, Snapchat, YouTube, porn. And, And it was almost like his mind was kind of whirring at the speed of Snapchat, where nothing still or serious could touch him. He's a lovely and very intelligent person. But it it was so disconcerting to see. And of course, in that decade in which he'd become a man, something like that had happened to lots of us. And and one day we were sitting on my sofa and all day I'd been trying to talk to him and I just couldn't get any traction with anything. And to be totally honest with you, I wasn't that much better. I was staring at my own devices in this kind of whir. Mm. And I suddenly remembered this moment all these years before. And I said to him, hey, let's go to Graceland. Mm. And he looked at me completely baffled. He didn't even remember this Elvis obsession, but I reminded him. And I said, no, this, we've got to break this numbing routine. We've got to get out of this. Let, let's go all over the South. 
But you've got to promise me one thing. You've got to leave your phone in the hotel during the day because obviously there's no point going if you're just going to stare at your phone all day. And he really thought about it. And I'm sure he was absolutely sincere. He promised he would do it. And so I think it was two weeks later, we took off from Heathrow, London Heathrow to New Orleans, which is where we went first. And about two weeks after that, we arrived at Graceland. And, and when you get to the gates of Graceland, this is even before COVID, there's no person to show you around. What happens is they, they hand you an iPad, you put in some earbuds and the iPad shows you around. It says, go left, go right. And every room you're in, you see a representation of that room on the iPad, right? And it's slightly weird because I sort of realise no one's actually really looking at Graceland. They're all just sort of staring at the iPad. And we... And I'm getting sort of slightly irritated by this. And, and we get to the jungle room, which was Elvis's favourite room in Graceland. It's got loads of fake plants in it. And there was a Canadian couple standing next to us. And the man turned to his wife and he said, honey, this is amazing. Look, if you swipe left, you can see the jungle room to the left. And if you swipe right, you can see the jungle room to the right. And I thought they were kidding. So I kind of laughed. It's so convenient. <laughs> so, well, that, I turned to them, but they're, they're literally just swiping back and forth, and I and I lean over and I said, "But hey, sir, there's an old-fashioned form of swiping you could do. <laughs> it's called turning your head. Because look, we're actually in the juggle room. You, you would you love have that. to look at the picture of it. <laughs> <laughs> we're literally there, right? And they, they, as you've correctly intuited, they looked at me like I was deranged and backed out of the room. And and I turned to my godson to laugh about it. And he was standing in a corner looking at Snapchat because from the moment we landed, he, he just could not stop. And I, and I went up to him and I did that thing. It's never a good idea to do with a teenager. I tried to grab the phone off him. And, and I said, you know, I know you're afraid of missing out, but this is guaranteeing that you'll miss out. Mm -hmm. You're not present at your own life. You're not showing up at the events of your own existence. And he stormed off, understandably, and I kind of stomped around Memphis on my own that, that day. And I found him that night in the Heartbreak Hotel where we were staying. And he was sitting by the swimming pool. I went up to him. He was staring at his phone, at Snapchat, and I, I apologised. And he didn't look up from his phone, but he said, I know something's really wrong and I don't know what it is. Oh. And that's when I thought for a long time I had been thinking about attention. You know, I could feel my own attention was getting worse. It felt like with each year that passed, things that required deep focus, like reading a book, watching long films, having proper conversations, things that are so important to me, were getting more and more like running up a down escalator. I could still do them, but they were getting harder. And I realised, oh, we went away to get away from this crisis of being present. But we couldn't because that crisis was everywhere. It was all around us. And that's when I thought, okay, you need to investigate this. And that's when I kind of started the journey for the, the book. I, I had a very similar thing happen with someone I'm close with who has a 14-year-old son. And over the holidays, we caught up and I noticed he was very, well, I thought I'll put it down to just a teenage teenager being a little bit moody and wanting to keep to themselves. But this person's dad actually brought him over to me and said, here, chat to Hugh. I think we had a we were we were talking about shoes or something, and I I tried to talk to him, and I every time I he was looking at his phone, and I thought he was I thought he was looking up what we were talking about, the shoes we were talking about, but every time I looked, I realised he was on Snapchat, and I couldn't I actually we we actually couldn't talk because whenever he stopped talking, he'd just look at Snapchat straight away, and I it was mm. such a depressing experience because I have felt this in so many areas of my life that our ability to well be present is one but just to do normal things like talk to other people and listen to other people and they're being eroded but you know it's okay now when someone's talking to check your text messages just have a quick look if you get a message that kind of stuff that it is so goes against what it is to be human you know and i i so i'd love to hear more about your trip where you decided well what was the next step for you after you had that experience in memphis yeah, good. I'm just thinking about what you're, what you're saying, because, you know, that experience you had, you're not alone. For every one child who was identified with serious attention problems when I was seven years old, there's now 100 children who've been identified with that oh. problem. Um, the average American office worker now focuses on any one task for only three minutes. But when I came back from Memphis, I was really locked in a way of thinking about this that I now realise was wrong. So I thought, Basically, my story for why my attention was getting worse was basically there were two, two aspects to it. One is I thought, you're just weak. You, your willpower isn't strong enough, right? Why are you weak? Why aren't you strong enough? 
And the other was someone invented the smartphone and that fucked me over, right? So because those were the, I later learned on the journey for the book, obviously that was those were wildly oversimplified stories. In fact, wrong in many ways. Um, but because those were my stories, I thought, oh, well, the solution seemed to me in a funny way kind of obvious. So I was in the lucky position that my, my first book, which you mentioned, Chasing the Scream, the film rights, the a film was being made of it called The United States versus Billie Holiday. Um, so I had a load of money. And I got back and I thought, fuck it, why am I just tolerating this fucking destruction in my brain? So I decided to go away for three months completely without the internet, right? Um, so I booked myself a, a, a room in a place called Provincetown in Cape Cod. I got in trouble on another podcast. I think they cut it, another Australian podcast, because I was trying to explain what Provincetown is like. And I said, <laughs> imagine Byron Bay with less surfing and more fisting. <laughs> Um, so it's basically, I don't know if you could leave that in or not. I apologise if it's too should. obscene. We but the, yeah, Provincetown, uh, to give you a less obscene way of describing Provincetown, Provincetown <laughs> is a town where more than one person makes a full-time living by dressing as Ursula, the villain from The Little Mermaid, and singing songs about cunnilingus, right? It's a great fucking place. So... I went to, there's literally two people, that's their job, right? Uh, so I, uh, and they hate each other. So I can imagine, <laughs> yeah. God. So I went to, I, I went to Provincetown and I, and I, I had no phone that could get online. And I had, a, my, my friend Imtiaz gave me his broken old laptop that could not get online either. So I left my smartphone and my internet enabled laptop in Boston. And I literally got a boat across the water to Provincetown. Um, and I was there for three months. And... Loads of things happened in Provincetown. I had some real ups and downs that I can talk about. But I guess the, the most significant thing was, I, like, you, like you said, Hugh, I thought, well, maybe my attention went to shit because I just got older, right? You know, I was, I was what was I, 39 then? Um, my attention in Provincetown, after some initial early bumps, was as good as it was when I was 18. I could sit and read books for eight hours a day at just... The, the degree to which my attention improved and healed quite rapidly absolutely kind of stunned me. Yeah, I um, had a similar experience to Hugh actually over the summer holidays where we, we drove up to, my girlfriend and I drove up to Sydney and and we were like, okay, on the drive up, we're listening to Stolen Focus. Like that's the trip. Like I was just so excited to almost because <laughs> I knew what it was about and I wanted to be motivated to actually get off my phone more. Like I wanted to use it as my motivation. It absolutely worked. And so spent most of my time, got myself a, um, a non-smartphone, which I've now referred to as my smug phone. Um, <laughs> and, and, I, and I had my smug phone and an iPad. And so I was using a, using a system that I'd sort of found on the internet that was working really well. And I had the exact same, maybe not the exact, but a really similar experience where my attention, uh, ability to sort of, I guess, to focus but also just like a feeling of like, it just felt lighter. I felt much lighter than I, than I ever mm. had and or in, in a long time. And it was, it was just so rewarding. And I've never been addicted to anything. I've never, um, you know, I've, I've always, I guess in a weird way, kind of always prided myself on the fact that I don't get addicted to things. And I've got like the, um, the inner strength to be able to stop before it gets yeah. to. But, the, but my mobile phone, my smartphone is the first thing that I have realized mm. that I'm genuinely addicted to and it's and it's terrifying. So it was quite an amazing like three, four weeks where I was, yes, I was in holiday mode. So it was much easier to not be on it all the time. And really similar thing to, to Hugh, as soon as the holiday finished and I came back to my, you know, normal life, uh, it was really hard to continue that routine of not being on your phone because you realize how clever the the tech companies have been in making evil. it evil evil is probably a yeah thing. yeah <laughs> it's <laughs> how, how how clever they are or evil they are in um making it a tool that you you need for so many things like I had to print out my proof of vaccination on a A4 piece of paper so I could go to restaurants, you know, <laughs> like stuff like that. It was just like, you ha it feels weird. Like I got my old digital camera out of my like drawer, which I hadn't used in 10, 15 years. And it, it's, you have to carry all these different things as opposed to this very simple device. And that's what I found really, really challenging on top of the addiction itself. That's so interesting because this, um, I remember when I, 
even before I went to Provincetown, when I was in Boston and I was trying to buy a phone that can't get online, people were just literally, they didn't understand the question. Like I remember going to Target <laughs> yeah. and the guy kept going like, oh, so this one doesn't have much internet. And I was like, no, 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 I want one that can't get the internet at all. <laughs> and it was literally like I, they couldn't understand what I was saying, you know. Yeah. But it was so interesting because... I later realised, so obviously, after I left Provincetown, I went on this big journey all over the world from Melbourne to Miami to Moscow to Montreal, not just to cities that begin with the letter M. And, and I learned, <laughs> and I interviewed over 200 of the leading experts on focus and attention in the world, and obviously used my training in the social sciences at Cambridge University to really dig deeply into their research. And I, and I, I learned that there's actually scientific evidence for 12 factors that can make your attention better or can make your attention worse. They include some aspects of things that are happening in our tech at the moment, but they also go way beyond them, from the food we eat to the air we breathe. But um, And I, I learned that loads of the factors that have been proven to make your attention worse have significantly increased in recent years. So if you're struggling to pay attention, it's not your fault. You're not imagining it. This is happening to almost all of us. And your attention didn't collapse. Your attention has been stolen from you. And I sort of realised as I was interviewing these experts, some of the reasons why my attention had improved so much in Provincetown. So I'll give you an example of something that I bet will be playing out for literally everyone listening to some degree today. So I went to MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, to interview one of the leading neuroscientists in the world, a man, a brilliant man named Professor Earl Miller. And he said to me, look, there's one thing you've got to understand about the human brain more than anything else. You can only consciously think about one or two things at a time. That's it. Mm. This is a fundamental limitation of the human brain. The human brain has not changed significantly in 40,000 years. It's not going to change on any time scale any of us are going to see. But what's happened is we've fallen for a mass delusion. The average teenager now believes they can follow six or seven forms of media at the same time. A bit like your friend's son. So... What happens is scientists get people into labs, not just teenagers, older people as well. And they get them to think they're doing more than one thing at a time. And what they discover is always the same. You can't do more than one thing at a time. What you do is you juggle very quickly between the tasks. What was that on WhatsApp? Wait, what did Hugh just ask me? What's that on the TV there about Ukraine? Oh shit, what's this message on Facebook? Wait, what did you ask me again? So you're mm -hmm. juggling. And it turns out that juggling comes with a really big cost. The technical term for it is the switch cost effect. When you try and do more than one thing at a time, you will do all the things you're trying to do much less competently. You'll make more mistakes. You'll remember less of what you do. You'll be significantly less creative. And that sounds like a small effect when you first hear about it. I remember speaking to Professor Miller and thinking, okay, I get it. But that's, A, I'm good at this stuff, even if other people aren't. And B, <laughs> yeah, that must be a fairly minor thing. When you look at the evidence, you know, it's pretty shocking. I'll give you an example of a very small study that's backed by a wider body of evidence. Hewlett Packard, the printer company, got a scientist in to study their workers. And he split their workers into two groups. And the first group was told, just get on with whatever your task is and you're not going to be interrupted. And the second group was told, get on with your task, whatever it is, but you're going to have to also answer a heavy load of email and phone calls. So pretty much how most of us live. And at the end of it, this scientist gave an IQ test to both groups. The group that hadn't been interrupted scored on average 10 IQ points higher than the group that had. To give you a sense of how big that is, if we all sat down now and spoke to Flat Spiff, Fat Spliff together and we got stoned, our IQs would go down in the short term by five points. So Jeez. you'd be better off sitting at your desk, getting stoned and doing one thing at a time than you would sitting at your desk, not getting stoned and being constantly interrupted. Now, to be clear, you'd be better off neither getting lesson, stoned nor being interrupted. But <laughs> That's the lesson from the today's <laughs> podcast. I think I'm pretty sure. Exactly. The main lesson, <laughs> along with fisting, is get stoned, get stoned and do your but work. The, the, so, but you can see this is why Professor Miller said that we're living in a perfect storm of cognitive degradation as a result of being interrupted. You know, if you're interrupted, it takes you on average 23 minutes to get back to the level of focus you had before you were interrupted. But what I realised is in Provincetown, for the first time in my adult life, no one was interrupting me, right? I felt like, I mean, this is a bit of a weird analogy, but I felt like for years I had been followed around by a fucking giant parade of people banging cymbals, screaming and shouting, <laughs> wanking, you know, yelling. And then suddenly 
they all just, the parade went away. And I could just sit down and read a book, mm. right? It, mm. Does that ring true to you? Yeah, yeah. there's some fascinating websites you're looking at. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, uh, my, 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 um, I guess just a quick story for you to really support everything you're saying. But mm. I, on the way to, to the holiday, when I, the first time I put my phone away and I had no device with me, I listened to the radio and I noticed myself going, that's a shit song and changing the station. That's a shit song, change the station. And I kept doing that until I found a song I really liked. Mm. But then on the way back, three weeks later, after not having any device, any interruption at all, I drove back and I had the radio on one station and it wasn't a conscious thing, but... I didn't love the song, but I just let it go and just let the next song go. And then about six or seven songs in, a song came on that I really loved. And I loved it so much. Like I went, oh, <laughs> I love this song. I mean, I could listen to that song any time I want with, with, at any stage. But I feel like with what's happened with, with, with technology and the internet, we get whatever we want and, we, and we, we're not satisfied until everything has to be really good. It has to be a great song. But I had the feeling of when I was a kid and you listen to the radio, your only way to listen to music and you just hope your favourite song comes on. And when you do, it's just, it's elation. And I had that again. And when mm. I when I realised how much I was loving that song, I, it, I realised the change had come over me in three weeks was that I was just so much more calm. I was so much happier just to sit back and let things happen without trying to make things better all the time. And then the joy that happened with the patience of just, and to me, that that, that was a huge moment. I mean, it, it did stuff all because I'm back on my phone again. But but that three weeks was that 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 was the change that came over me. But that's so interesting. There's so many interesting things. What you just said, Hugh. One of them is. So I had a similar thing. I remember. So I later realised that actually loads of things had changed in Provincetown, Provincetown that improved my attention, not just uh, not having the tech. But I remember on my last day there, going to Long Point, which is like a it's by the lighthouse. You can sort of see the whole of Provincetown from there. And looking back over it and sort of realizing, God, this is where I've been for three months. I hadn't even been in a moving vehicle. And and thinking, I'm never going to go back to the way I was, right? Why would I go back to that? Mm. Like, this has been amazing. And I would say to anyone listening, just think about anything you've ever achieved in your life that you're proud of, whether it's, you know, setting up a business, being a good parent, learning to play the guitar. Whatever that thing you're proud of is, it took a huge amount of sustained focus and attention. And when focus and attention break down, as they clearly are now, your ability to achieve your goals breaks down. Your ability to solve your problems breaks down. And when you start to get your focus back, you're like, it's, you, you have a feeling that you are competent again, mm. right? It's, it's like when you, when you can't pay attention, when your attention is diminished, I think in a way you become like a kind of stump of yourself, right? You can sense what you would have been, but you feel like you can't get there. And, and, and I thought, God, why would I ever give this up? And I took the ferry back to Boston. I got really sick on the ferry, got my phone back. Within a month, I was 80% back to where I'd been. Mm. And I only really understood why. I never went back to being quite as bad. And later I got better because I integrated a lot of what I learned. But I only really understood why when I went to Moscow in Russia to interview Dr. James Williams, who had been a senior strategist at Google. So was at the heart of part of the machinery that's been fucking up our attention, was so horrified by what they're doing, he quit and became, I would argue, the leading philosopher of attention in the world. And I went to see him and he said to me, look, the mistake you've made, Johan, is what you've done, I'm sure it was very nice, but he said what you've done is a bit like thinking the solution to air pollution is for you personally to wear a gas mask, right? Oh. I'm not against gas masks. If I lived in Beijing, I'd wear a gas mask. But gas masks aren't the solution to air pollution. The solution to air pollution is to actually take on the source of the pollution, right? And I had to think about that a lot and obviously do a lot of exploration around this. But I sort of realised with all of the 12 factors that I write about in Stolen Focus that are damaging our attention and focus, there's sort of two levels at which we've got to deal with them. I started to think of them as defence and offence, right? There are all sorts of things we can do as individuals to defend ourselves and our children. Um, and I'm passionately in favour of those things. Right? I'll give you one example of dozens that I go through in the book. Over there in the corner, I've got something called a K-safe. I should so be getting commission from these people, by the way, because their oh, sales right. have massively gone up. I'm getting no fucking money at all. I feel like a QVC person without getting the money from QVC. But uh, th So a K-safe is a plastic safe. You take off the lid, you put in your phone, you put on the lid, 
you turn the dial and it locks your phone away for anything between five minutes and a whole day. I won't sit down and watch a film with my boyfriend unless we both imprison our phones. I won't let people come around for dinner unless they agree to put their phone in the phone jail. Um, so that's one example of uh, I- many. Ironically, mm. Johan, my first thought was, where's my phone? I want to Google that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> Oh, that? fuck. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> We're trapped in the vortex. We, uh, but the, the, but it's that, that, that's one example of dozens that I go through in the book of things that I'm passionately in favour of people doing that can really help. But I just want to be honest, and particularly it will help their children because a lot of the book is about our kids. But I just want to be honest with people in a way that I don't think most books about attention are, to be honest. Those things will really help. They will boost your attention, but they will only get you so far. Because at the moment, it's like someone is pouring itching powder into our heads all the time and then leaning forward and going, do you know what, mate? Um, you might want to learn how to meditate. Then you wouldn't scratch so much. Mm-hmm. And you want to go, okay, I'll learn to meditate. That's hugely valuable. But you need to stop pouring fucking itching powder on me, right? <laughs> and this is where the offense comes from. We've got to take on the forces that are doing this to us. Can I, before we get to that, I, I would love you to talk sure. about mind wandering because I, the beautiful power of, of mind wandering, because that was one of the things I absolutely noticed over my summer holidays was I started having these memories coming back that I haven't had these memories of childhood that I, I, I don't know where they came from, but it was when my mind was wondering, I started solving problems in my life and coming up with solutions for issues. So yes, I'd love to fit for you to talk our listeners through mind wandering. Yeah. The, the. It, it was really interesting because when I went to Provincetown, I thought, okay, so I've come here to get my deep focus back. So like for me, a lot of that was around reading books. So I read a huge amount of books, right? And I thought, oh, this is what I came here to do. And I also brought with me, I couldn't obviously couldn't have audio books on my phone. So I brought my iPod, which is so funny. It seemed like such a modern invention when I first got it. And people would like, it looked like a fucking relic from Noah's Ark by the time I went. But <laughs> I, lo- I had loaded a load of audio books onto my iPod. And then about a month in, I sort of thought, why? I, I just want to go for a walk without anything to stimulate me. And I went for a long walk in Provincetown is one of the most beautiful places in the world. And each day I, I went for these really long walks and they built up to like, I was, a lot of time I was walking for like five hours a day. And at first I thought, oh, this isn't why you came here, right? You, you, you came here to focus, not to, but actually what, what I, I, I was also finding is that these periods of just mind wandering, of letting my mind just, just float were just incredibly fertile. I felt so much better afterwards. I was having so many ideas. I was thinking about things in new ways. And it was only later after I left Provincetown, I went to interview some of the leading experts on on mind wandering, like Professor Marcus Reichel, who, who's at the University of um, Washington in St. Louis, Missouri, where I went to interview him. And, and he had actually made a whole series of breakthroughs about the science of mind wandering. And, and, and he explained to me, him and others explained to me, you know, when you're mind wandering, it's funny, he had actually been told off as a kid when he grew up in Aberdeen in Washington State. His teachers were always telling him off for daydreaming, right? We're taught that's like a bad thing to do, to mm-hmm. let your mind wander. You should be in this deep focus all the time. Um, but actually what he discovered is when you let your mind wander, in fact, you are your mind is paying attention to really important things. When you mind wander, you're processing the past and things that have happened. You're anticipating the future and preparing yourself for the future. You're also making connections between different things that you didn't see. In fact, mind wandering is a really precious and important form of attention. And interestingly, I think it's the form of attention we've most lost. Because at the moment, we're we're in the worst of all worlds. We're neither mind wandering, nor are we deep focusing. We're just jammed up with switching all the time. What was that? What did he just say? Wait, what? Wait, how? uh, Wait, okay, let me get back to that. Wait, I've got to reply to this person just quickly. We're sort of jammed up. You'll see it. Look, anyone, there'll be people listening to this podcast in a queue, right, in the supermarket. Look around you. None of them will just be standing there letting their minds wander, right? They'll all be looking at their phones. we've, We've squeezed out the space for mind wandering. And when you squeeze out the space for mind wandering, you're less prepared for life. You, you actually become more brittle. It's often in periods of mind wandering that you figure out who you are and who you want to be. And I think we've really lost, well, we've definitely lost the space for mind wandering and and, and, it, and regaining it for me was so powerful. It's one of the big changes I made after Provincetown. Now, 
Whatever happens, I spend an hour where I go for a walk every day, doesn't matter where I am in the world, with no devices, just just to let my mind wander. And that's always the most creative hour of my day. Yeah, it's I. It rem, this all you're talking about reminds me of those three weeks that I, that I had without you know without my smartphone on yeah. me all the time. And at first, there is a fear, which I know a lot of people feel, of separating yourself from your from your smartphone in the fear of not being able to be contacted or not being able to see an important message or something that comes through. Um, the thing that I, in my experience at least, the thing that I found is that you're way less popular than you think you are. <laughs> you know, you, you're kind of, it's like when you forget your phone, you like leave it at home and you're like, oh, I forgot my phone. And then you're consciously thinking, oh, I've left my phone at home. And then all you're thinking is like, oh, I wonder how many messages they're going to be. And then you get home and you look at your phone and there's like one message from your mum um, and, <laughs> and like a couple of like spam emails. And you think, huh, that's weird. Must be an off day. <laughs> but, it, but it is, it was No, an you're amazing- totally right. I think in a way, for a lot of us, definitely for me, that, that kind of, oh, I'm so in demand is a kind of conceit we use to rationalise our addiction, right? Yeah. Mm. You know, I'm I'm not the president of the United States. I don't need to give orders in the event that Russia invades Ukraine, right? Mm. It's, I'm not that important, right? Yeah. And I remember even even when I came back from Provincetown, even with all the pleasure and joy I'd had from that, I remember before I went back going, thinking in this slightly almost kind of masochistic way, oh, I'm going to have so many emails to answer when I get back. Mm. And I'd had an auto-reply set up. I thought, oh, it's going to take me a week to get through all my emails, <laughs> It took me like half an hour. Basically, if you just go away, people don't... But I would say a Mm. lot of people will hear this, right? And and this is where one one of the many different ways I think we need to go on offence against the factors that are doing this to us become important. So lots of people will have heard me say, for example, that I spend four hours... You know, I can't remember if I mentioned this, but the case, if I use that four hours a day to do my writing, right? And, And lots of people will hear that and go... Well, fuck you. I can't do that. I've got a job, right? Mm. My boss will message me if I'll get in trouble, right? I can't Mm. do that. And they're absolutely right. Um, And that's why I think we need to learn from somewhere that that, that made a big change. So in France, in 2018, they had a really big crisis of what they called le burnout, which I don't think I need to translate. And (laughs) the French government, the French government under pressure, (laughs) exactly. (laughs) The, The French government, uh, was hugely pressured by trade unions. Really important to stress, they would never have done this without trade unions. Um, and so they set up a government inquiry led by a guy called Bruno Metling to just figure out what the hell was going on, right? Why was everyone getting so burned out? And and what they discovered, they discovered lots of things, but they discovered that 35% of French workers felt they could never stop checking their phone the whole time they were awake because their boss could email them or phone them at any time of the day or night. And if they didn't answer, they'd be in trouble. So I can give those people all the lovely self-help lectures in the world about more sleep, the use of the K-safe, dozens of things I talked about in the book. That's not going to be a liberation to them. That's going to be a fucking taunt. It's like going up to a homeless person and saying, do you know what, mate? Do you know what would make you feel much better? Why don't you go into that lovely restaurant and buy a steak? Right? It's like, well, yeah, but I can't do that. Mm. Right? So that's why we need to have this additional level. So what the the inquiry recommended and French unions fought for and achieved, so the French government introduced it into law, is a very simple reform called the right to disconnect. It gives every French worker two rights. Firstly, your work hours have to be laid out in your contract. They have to be written down. And secondly, once your work hours are over, you have the legal right to not answer your phone or check your email. And so I went to Paris uh, to research this. And just before I was there, rent a kill the pest control company, was fined €70,000 for trying to get one of their workers to check his email an hour after he left work. Now, you can see how that's a collective change that will only happen if we all fight for it, that sets people free to make some of the individual changes they want to make, right? I mean, there's no point telling people about, I don't know, for example, the benefits of sleep if they've got to be staring at a glowing screen until the minute they go to sleep because their boss is messaging them, right? That's not. It, it, you've, you've got to put in place these collective changes. That's one of dozens of collective changes I think we need to fight for so that we can make it easier for people to make the individual changes. We've got to have both. We've got to have the individual changes and there's a lot we can do now, but we've also got to fight together to take on the forces that are pouring this itching powder over us. 
Yeah, it's the other thing it makes me think about is so this is a little bit of behind the curtain of us, but um, I think it's relevant. But we, you know, this year on the podcast, we've we've for the first time we're hiring people. Like we've got people helping. We've got a team mm. of sorts. You know, um, not of sorts. We have a team. Um, <laughs> we'll denigrate them on the fourth week. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, yeah, we have a team, and so we use the app, an app called Slack, right? And so the thing with an app like Slack, even email, it's the same thing. But there's there's constant communication between the team, which is incredible. Like it's amazing that at any time of the day, I have you know if I have a thought at 10 p.m., I can go, oh, we've got to remember to do that. So instead of reminding myself to talk about it with the team tomorrow, I'll like jump on Slack and write a message to everyone and just put it on the thing, and everyone gets this like reminder that I'm reminding everyone at 10 p.m. And in my mind, I'm like, I don't want anyone to reply now. This is just for the record. So we, when people look at Slack next, they can be reminded of it and we can talk about it. But what happens naturally, of course, is that if someone writes a message, unless I say, do not reply now, um, wait until tomorrow morning when you, <laughs> whenever you want. But people like, everyone's on their phones all the time. Everyone's on computers or something. So people just naturally go, oh, I'll reply now. So I don't forget to do it tomorrow morning. Mm. And so then it creates this yeah. cycle of people constantly at all hours of the day. And I'm, I'm already really conscious of the fact that, I don't know what you guys think, but mm. conscious of the fact that we're already falling into bad falling habits. into yeah. these, these habits. Well, 10 30 last night. We're all, we're all commenting on stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And it's fun and it's well, great, you, you but know, it's but a bad, it's probably a bad habit. Well, if you want to think about what you're losing when you do that, there's lots of things, but there was someone who really helped me to think about this. Is the guy I mentioned before, Dr. James Williams, who had been at the heart of Google. Um, he had this real, really fascinating moment. He spoke at a tech conference that was full of people who've designed things that you are using, that I'm using, mm. that our kids are using, right? And he said to them, if there's anyone here at this conference who wants to live in the world that we're creating, please put up your hand now and not one person put up their hand, right? So James became this totally fascinating thinker. And he argued that there's there's kind of um, three layers of attention. I would actually argue there's four. I know he would agree with this because I put it to him. So we tend to, the most obvious form of la layer of attention that we think about, it comes back to something you said before, Hugh. Um, so you think about, let's say for example, right now, uh, I said, oh guys, can we stop for a second? I'll just go to my fridge and get a Diet Coke. And I go over to get the Diet Coke and on the way I look at my phone and I've got a text from my friend and I reply and I'm like, wait, why did I come in here? And I come back and I've forgotten my Diet Coke, right? So that that form of attention where your short-term, your ability to do short-term immediate tasks is the kind of form of attention we most think about. And that form of attention he calls your spotlight. So your spotlight, you think about, I don't know, a Think about Madison Square Gardens. Before someone comes on stage, it's full, it's bustling. And then Adele walks on the stage and the, all everything goes silent and the light comes up on Adele, right? So the spotlight, your spotlight is your ability to filter out everything else and just attend to one immediate task. I want to get this Diet Coke. I want to find my copy of that book, whatever it might be. So obviously... We all know that form of attention is being disrupted all the time, right? Your, every, all your colleagues who look at Slack, you know, they got that message, whatever they were doing, if they were sitting there reading a book, if they were talking to their girlfriend, if they were playing with their kids, presumably not a tent night, depends on how the kids are, but whatever, that got interrupted and and they they went on to responding, re, re, responding to you, Ryan, and they got knocked off course, right? But there's a, a layer of attention above that. So if that's how you, your ability to achieve your short-term goals. There's a layer above that, which he calls your starlight, which is your ability to achieve your medium to long-term goals. So that's not, I want to go to the fridge and get a Diet Coke. That's, I want to set up a business. I want to write a book. Whatever your, your medium to long-term goal is. It's called your starlight because when you're lost in the desert and you try to figure out what direction you're going in, you look at the stars and you're like, oh, that's the direction I'm heading in, right? And I think we can all see that our ability to achieve our, our longer term goals is, is being disrupted. There's a layer above that that, that, that Dr. Williams calls, calls your daylight. And your daylight is how you even know what your long term goals are in the first place. 
How do you know you want to set up a business? How do you know what it means to be a good parent? How do you know what kind of book you want to write? To get that kind of, to, to, to know those things about yourself, you've got to have periods of mind wandering. You've got to have a lot of rest. You, you've got to have space to think. And if you, and here, it's called your daylight because you can see a, a room most clearly when it's flooded with daylight, right? And I think that form of attention is is being profoundly disrupted. We don't have the space to think about who we want to be. We feel like we're we're sort of lost in our own lives. And there's a layer of attention I would put above even that, which I would call our stadium lights, which is not just our ability to achieve, you know, to formulate and achieve long term goals for, our, for for you as an individual, but our ability as a society to see and hear each other and formulate collective goals for our society. I think a lot about Australia, I write about this at the end of the book because I love Australia. You know, I think a lot about the black summer you had, you know, the place fucking burned down and you still don't have a climate policy, right? The, 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 not that my country's so much better. Don't, I'm not lording it over you. The, you know, something's gone. It's not a coincidence that we're having an enormous crisis of, democracy and the ability to achieve collective goals at the same time that attention has so profoundly broken down. It's not the only thing going on, obviously, but I do think it's playing a big role. So I think all these different layers. So it seems like such a small thing. My mm. Slack message interrupted this person, but it's part of this much bigger tapestry of disruption that is happening all the time and it's disrupting so many layers of our lives and who we are in ways that is profoundly destructive i think wow so you're saying keep messaging at 10 p.m <laughs> <laughs> no, you I know what i would legalize drugs and criminalize slack if i could but that's yes. a whole other debate okay we'll talk that's the next book <laughs> <laughs> um johan i really haven't said a thing since you started um and I think it's hi, because hi, I think it's because I'm I'm <laughs> kind of uh, terrified to be honest, um, and it's I'm I'm scared because I, I didn't read your book and I haven't read it yet and I'm sorry I haven't and I want to, but I've almost <laughs> um, I think it's because I'm scared to read it, and if I'm I've just been sitting here going over my life and thinking, all our listeners know that. My, because we've talked about it a lot, my sister had a really bad eating disorder when she was younger. And I'm thinking right now that the, the moment that um, that happened was about the time I first discovered the internet. Um, and I reckon I was using it to, it's, it's pretty obvious that I used it in whatever kind of thing I could look up and be distracted by it to get an endorphin hit to suppress the pain that I was experiencing at home. And I, I've, I've done it for um, 20, uh, 24 years, 23 years. And I know that I still can't stop doing it um, in every moment of the day. And I'm pretty terrified about what I'd do without it. Um, and if I'm feeling like that, then there's got to be about, like a huge amount of people who feel like that. And I want more than anything to stop, but I just don't know how. That's really moving, Josh, and you should be really proud of yourself for thinking about it and being brave enough to say it. How, how is your sister doing now? Uh, yeah, she's good. She's really good. Yeah, she's... I'm really glad to hear that. Yeah. Thriving, but yeah. I think I think there's a lot of things in what, in, in what, in what you said, and I think, um, you know... We had a lot of addiction in my family. One of my earliest memories is of trying to uh, wake up one of my, my relatives and not being able to. And I didn't, um, I was too young to understand why then, but as I got older, I realised we had addiction in my family. And I think <clears throat> that thing you're describing, every addictive behaviour is an attempt to not be present with something painful. Every addictive behaviour, you know, the core of addiction is about not wanting to be present in your life because there's too much pain for you to approach it. So you, and that can be true of whether it's gambling addiction, porn addiction, cocaine addiction, whatever it is. And particularly addiction rooted in, in childhood trauma, which it sounds to me like you're, you're describing as something that was very much playing out for me as well. And I think in a sense in that conversation... 
that addiction is doing a job for you, right? The addiction to the technology is doing a good, uh, an important job for you, right? And all addiction does an important job for people. There's a really challenging line in Marianne, you know, Marianne Faithful, the British rock star. Annoyingly, she's remembered mostly for being Mick Jagger's girlfriend. She's much fucking better than Mick Jagger. No disrespect <laughs> to Mick Jagger, who I've actually met and is a very nice person. But, uh, and Marianne had, um, she had a heroin addiction in the 60s. She was homeless and she had a heroin addiction. And she says this very challenging line, particularly challenging for me because I had heroin addiction close to me. She said, heroin saved my life. Because if it wasn't for heroin at that point, I would have killed myself, right? Now, Marianne is not saying that heroin is a good solution to despair, obviously. She's saying it's the best solution to despair she had at that moment in her life. So in a sense, what I would want to do with what you're saying is not pathologise your relationship with the technology. That technology's done, that, that behaviour has done a really good job for you, right? And I'm not going to come in and say to you, take it away. Because if that's taken away and you're just left with this terrible pain and trauma, that would actually be really harmful to you. So I would say, as with all addiction, what will help will be to see it as a symptom of a deeper pain and to carefully, in a supported environment, approach that pain and in a way, not even think about the symptom for a long time, right? Let the symptom, ca- let the let that compulsive behaviour carry on doing its good job for you. Because it may be, if the alternative is being with like, lots of pain, great, stay with that behaviour, approach the pain. And then over time, the need for that addictive behaviour can become less if the shame and pain is less. Does that, does that ring true to you, Josh? It does. But I think what I find... Uh, Ter- terrifying moving forward is the fact that I think I've obviously haven't done enough work, but I've done a lot of work on it with a wonderful psychologist. And I a hundred percent agree with everything you say, everything you just said then. And I think it did exactly the job it needed to do for a very long time. But I think as you so eloquently have put in this interview, and I look forward to reading the book in the last 20 years, the world, the air in which I've breathed it has become, has manipulated me and made the tech companies and the world in which we're in has taken advantage of my pain and has preyed on it and made it more and more and more addictive. So now it feels like the addiction doesn't really have anything to do with the the initial pain that it was trying to cover up. Mm-hmm. And I think I've dealt with the pain, but now I'm stuck with a new addiction that is purely due to the world in which we live. So... I would say a few things about that. That's really powerful what you just said. I'm just thinking about it. And the, the first thing I would say is, this might sound odd, but I would talk about an example from Australian history. Because it's very easy when we think about these tech companies and the way they're manipulating us, and it's important for everyone to understand, these the Facebook, the social media companies, they are designed, their products are designed to hack and invade our attention, right? I can talk about how and why. It's essentially because they, every time you pick up your phone and start scrolling, they start making money. And every time you put it down, their revenue disappears. So all their algorithms, all their engineering power, all this genius in Silicon Valley is designed to figure out, okay, how do we get you to pick up your phone as often as possible and scroll as long as possible? Because that's how they make money. It's not a conspiracy any more than it it's not a conspiracy that KFC want you to eat fried chicken and it's not a conspiracy that they, based on their current business model, want you to keep scrolling. But I I would talk about, I mean, there's lots of things we could say about this, but it can feel very disempowering when you hear, oh, fuck, there's this enormous machinery of brilliant people designed to manipulate us. But I would talk about a few examples from history where, Because if you alone have to fight that, you're right, it's disempowering, right? Because, you know, as my friend Tristan Harris, who again worked at the heart of Google, said, you know, you can try having self-control, but on the other side of the screen, there's 10,000 engineers trying to undermine your self-control, right? Our power doesn't largely, to resist this, doesn't mostly lie as individuals, although there are things we can do as individuals that I talk about in the book, and I'm happy to talk about here, our power to resist this largely lies collectively. So I'll give you an example from Australian history. I think you guys are a bit, you're definitely a bit younger than me. I'm 43. So I can just remember this. When I was a kid, the standard form of petrol in Britain, in Australia, in fact, across the Western world, was leaded petrol, right? So petrol that had lead in it. Um, A bit before my time, only just, people used to paint their houses with leaded paint. 
And then it was discovered that exposure to lead really fucks your brain and in particular fucks up children's ability to focus and pay attention. Uh, So what happened is a group of ordinary Australian housewives banded together and they said, why are we allowing this? Why are we allowing these companies to fuck up our kids' brains so they can make money? This is crazy. And it's important to notice what they didn't say. They didn't say, so let's ban all paint. And they didn't say, let's ban all petrol. They said, let's ban the specific component in the petrol and the paint that is that is fucking up our kids' brains. And they fought and they fought. And it took years, but they succeeded. They got lead banned. Uh, we, we're not exposed to lead anymore in the environment, much less there's still some lead piping in, in Australia, but not, not very much. And as a result, the Centre for Disease Control calculated that the average American child is now three to five IQ points higher than they would have been had we not banned this, right? So you've got this thing that seems big and powerful. The lead industry was really powerful and rich. And ordinary people identified that it was harming their attention and took it on. And in the same way with the tech industry, one of the things I learned in Silicon Valley and that was so interesting and important to me is it's there's some aspects... There's there's some degree to which the invention of the smartphone and the laptop would have harmed our attention, but most of the harm to our attention is not coming from the existence of the technology. It's coming from the design of the apps that are in the technology. And it turns out these apps don't have to work this way, and we could deal with this collectively, just like we took on the lead industry. So uh, there was a moment this really fell into place with me. To me, I went to interview someone called Aza Raskin, who invented a key part of how the internet works. His dad, Jeff Raskin, invented the Apple Macintosh for Steve Jobs. And Aza said to me that there's an equivalent to the lead in the lead paint, right? And that we could we can take on and ban. And that's the current business model. It, the kind of technical term for it is surveillance capitalism. So at the moment, all social media is designed around a business model where when you use the social media, it tracks you. It learns who you are to figure out the weaknesses in your attention so it can keep you scrolling. The longer you scroll, the more money they make, partly because you see advertising. We all know how that works as you scroll, but also because they learn more about you. They learn more about your weaknesses and they learn more information to sell to advertisers, right? So the longer you scroll, the more money they make. That's the current business model. But you can have all of the social media we currently have and have it not designed that way, just like we've still got petrol, but it's not got lead in it. Um, And Asa said to me, the solution for this component, which is one of the 12 factors I talk about in Stolen Focus that are harming our attention, the solution to that is really simple. He said, ban the current business model. Say that a business model that is built on secretly tracking you to figure out the weaknesses in your attention, that's just inhuman and we won't allow it. And I remember when Asa said this to me and lots of other people in Silicon Valley said this to me, it took me a long time to get my head around it. I was like, "Well, well, hang on, let's imagine we do that. The next day when I opened Facebook, would it just say, sorry, guys, we've gone fishing? He said, of course. He said, of course not. What would happen is they'd have to move to a different business model. And everyone listening has an experience of the two alternative business models. One is subscription. Okay, everyone knows how Netflix works. You pay a certain amount, you get access. Another is think about the sewers, right? Before we had sewers, we had shit in the streets. We got cholera. So we all pay to build and maintain the sewers and we all own the sewers together. Anyone listening, you own the sewers in your town along with everyone else who lives there. In the same way that we want to own the sewage pipes together, because, you know, to to prevent cholera, we might want to own the information pipes together because we're getting the informational equivalent of cholera, right? Um, But whatever alternative model we choose, the key thing to understand is all the incentives change, right? At the moment, you are not the customer of Facebook, TikTok, Twitter. You are the product they sell to their real customer, advertisers. They're selling your attention to those advertisers. So it's all built around hacking and invading your attention. But if we move to this different business model, either of them, suddenly you become the customer. Suddenly they have to go, oh, what does Josh want? Oh, it turns out Josh wants to be able to pay attention. Okay, let's design our app not to hack his attention, but to heal his attention. Oh, Josh wants to actually meet up with his friends offline because people feel better when they're staring into each other's faces and not fucking staring at screens. Oh, we could design our app to facilitate that. We could introduce a button that encourages people to meet up with each other, right? All these things are completely technologically easy. People I met in Silicon Valley could design them in a week, but we've got to get the incentives right. And 
that's why we've got to change the business model. That's something we can totally do, right? I mean, James Williams, the guy I mentioned before, he said to me, the axe existed for 1.4 million years before anyone thought to put a handle on it. The entire internet has existed for less than 10,000 days, right? We can get this shit right. We can fix it. We can we can stop it being designed to hack and invade our attention, which has disastrous effects on us individually and in our politics, and instead have it designed to help us and heal us and help us achieve our goals. Technology should be something that helps us. I don't want us all to convert and join the Amish. I don't want us to abandon our technology. I want to have good technology that helps us achieve our goals. And that is absolutely achievable. Wow. Well, I feel a bit better now. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> feel a bit empowered. <laughs> I just, I'm, just, I'm just. Well, can I also say one other thing? that Because mm. I, I think a lot of people, they hear me say that and totally reasonably they say, oh, but fuck, big tech is so powerful. How are we ever going to do that? Actually, this is the first and only time I will ever praise Scott Morrison. But think about what Scott Morrison did a year ago, right? You know, as most people will know, news media is being bankrupted. Because advertising that used to go to the Sydney Morning Herald or, or the Melbourne Age or whatever, overwhelmingly now goes to Facebook. So people go to Facebook to get their news. They see the news from the Melbourne Age on Facebook, but Melbourne, the Melbourne Age doesn't get any of that money. So the Australian government totally rightly said to Facebook, you've got to give some of this advertising revenue to the, to, to the news media because you're benefiting from their product, but you're not paying for it. And it's a disaster for democracy if you don't have news media. Um, and you remember what happened. Facebook shit the bed. They screamed and shouted. They cut off Australia for a little while from various functions. And then what happened? They gave in because we're more powerful than them. And if Scott Morrison can do it, anyone can. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. If, if we have to turn to Scotty from marketing to yeah, save I'm the sure world, we, we really are better. fucked. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but I would also give another example when I have to think about, okay, we've got a big fight here, right? And I argue in the book that as well as doing lots of things as individuals, we've got to form an attention movement, right? We, we've got a band together to take on these forces because we're really in a race, right? On the one hand, you've got these 12 factors that are invading our attention, many of which are poised to become more powerful. You know, Paul Graham, one of the biggest investors in Silicon Valley said, the world will be more addictive in the next 40 years than it was in the last 40 um, think about how much more addictive TikTok is than Facebook, right? Now imagine the next crack-like iteration of TikTok. So that's one side of the race, all these forces that could become more powerful. On the other side of the race, we've got to have a movement of all of us saying, no, no, you don't fucking get to do this to us. No, you don't get to do this to our children. No, we don't want a life where we're constantly distracted. We want a life where we can focus, where we can read, where our children can play outside. We... We choose a life of focus. And, and to do that, it requires a shift in psychology. You know, we are not medieval peasants begging at the court of King Zuckerberg for a few little crumbs of attention from his table. We are the free citizens of democracies and we own our own minds and we can take them back. And if we want to think about that, this is the bit that I think might sound strange. People say to me, but they're so powerful. And I always say to them, in 1963, my grandmothers were the age I am now. One of them was a working class Scottish woman and the other was a Swiss woman living in a wooden hut on the side of a mountain. Neither of my grandmothers were allowed to have bank accounts in their own names because they were married women. It was legal for their husbands to rape them as it was legal in every country in the world for a man to rape his wife. My Swiss grandmother wasn't even allowed to vote. Right, this is not some distant past. I loved my grandmothers. I knew them really well. This is when they were the age I am now. And I think about my grandmother's lives who was, that were was so fucking disfigured by sexism, right? They never got to be the people they could have been. You know, my Swiss grandmother loved to paint and draw. They told her to shut the fuck up and get into the kitchen. And then I think about my niece. I don't want to underestimate how much further we've got to go on women's rights. But I think about my niece, who's 17, who sadly never knew my grandmother. She loves to paint and draw. When she loved to paint and draw, we started Googling art schools, right? I mean, if and even the craziest fucking right-wing person wouldn't say that we should, if someone said that my niece, it should be legal to rape her or she shouldn't be allowed to have a bank account or shouldn't be allowed to vote. I mean, no one says that, right? Literally no one. I mean, maybe some depraved incel in the darkest corners of the internet, but I've never heard anyone talk like that, right? And when people say these forces are powerful, I would say to them, they are, 
that they're literally not a hundredth as powerful as men were in 1963, right? At that time, men controlled every company in the world, every country in the world, every institution of power in the world. And they had, ever since those institutions had been invented, thousands of years before, right? Women didn't just give up. They got up and a lot of sympathetic men sided with them. And they just said, we're not fucking taking this anymore. And and just like we needed a, a need a feminist movement for women to reclaim their bodies and their lives, I would argue we, we need an attention movement to reclaim our minds. And we can do it, right? Mark Zuckerberg is vastly less powerful than men were in 1963. No one fucking likes Mark Zuckerberg, right? I strongly suspect even his wife doesn't like Mark Zuckerberg, right? Although I do, I do slightly have a secret crush on Mark Zuckerberg, but we won't talk about that. Wow. It's so disgusting. Yeah, I don't but know. The, uh, the, I've even Googled to try to find anyone else in the world who has a crush on Mark Zuckerberg, and I can't oh. find one. But the, uh, it would be, as you can tell, it would be hate sex. But the, yeah, so we. we we absolutely consensual hate sex. I would like to. Add. Well, I mean, I feel um, like it's fair because Mark Zuckerberg has been fucking us for so long. So it's... <laughs> exactly. Mm. Sorry, that was a very long and ranty answer. <laughs> well, I mean, Johan, it's it's like that was incredible. I, I feel genuinely, I feel changed and inspired. Yeah, me too. Um, and I desperately need to hug Josh. Um, so oh. uh, I, I feel like we should wrap it up there and, and let you have, I assume it's late, late at night there or at some point in the night for you. I'm essentially nocturnal. I basically live on Sydney time in London, right. so it's fine. Okay, <laughs> great. No well, we can't thank you enough. The book is incredible. Um, it truly is. I mean, anyone who's just listened to that, that's like a small taste. Um, and, and it really did change me, even though I haven't continued my habits of those weeks I was on the holiday, I still have my smug phone and I'm still using it quite a lot. And it, it was because of, of your book. So um, thank it you is, sincerely. Yeah. I, I just add to that. When you look at the crisis happening around the world at the moment, I, there's a lot going on, but I, I look at what you're addressing as, as potentially the biggest problem along with climate change the world currently faces. And I, I see you at the front of that. And I, 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 I sorry, at the front of that fight. And I, I it's a, an unbelievably important book for for the world right now and I, I think it's extraordinary what yeah what you've done oh thank you you know James Williams said to me the guy I mentioned before said to me when we think about the attention crisis he said imagine you're driving somewhere and someone throws a bucket of mud over your windshield it doesn't matter what you've got to do whenever you get to your destination the first thing you've got to do is clean your windshield right mm. otherwise you're not going to get anywhere and I feel like that, that's a really good metaphor for the attention crisis because it doesn't matter what your goal is if, if you can't pay attention, you're going to really struggle to achieve that goal. So, yeah, I, I do believe this is, it's not the biggest crisis in the world. And obviously climate is bigger. A lot of other things are bigger. But I think it is the first crisis in the world, the one that we have to deal with at the very first level, or we're going to really struggle to deal with any of the others. But I just wanted to say, Josh, I'm, to you, I'm, I'm so moved by, by, by what you said and the mm. articulacy with which you said it. And so much of dealing with any problem is about having the bravery to articulate it, to talk about your fear about it. Mm. And I know that must have been really difficult and must be really difficult, but you should be really proud of yourself for doing that. And that is a big part of the, the struggle is just to mm. be honest with yourself about a crisis and articulate it and start to reach out for, for solutions. So you should be really, yeah. um, yeah, really proud of yourself. And yeah, thanks right. for listening and, and giving me hope. Oh. Hooray. I would give you a hug if, if A, we were not thousands of mi- 10,000 miles away and B, that wouldn't kill us all because of COVID. It's funny, I've gotten back into the hugging the hugging habit now. But I, what am I meant to say? I meant to say, my, my publishers give me this ridiculous script that I meant to say at the end of the podcast, which I can't read out because it makes me sound like an absolute dick. But please try, please I'm try. Say, anyone, who wa- anyone who wants to get the audio book, the ebook, or the physical book can go to stolenfocusbook.com. Uh, you can basically get it anywhere. I meant to say you can get it in all good bookshops, but I always want to say you can also get it in shit bookshops. It's yeah. not like we have a test. Where you can go like, Sorry, your bookshop is not good enough to stock my book. And you can also on the uh, website, you can hear extracts, of audio of interviews with all the experts oh, wow. that we've awesome. talked about uh, for free. And uh, you can also see where to follow me on social media, but I will not follow you back because I don't look at it. Uh, um, <laughs> But I almost never look at it. And I, I just funny, I got into trouble in a podcast about a year ago where this guy interviewed me. It's relevant to know this was a 50-year-old man, right? Mm. And at the end of the interview, he said to me, so what's your Twitter? And I said it. And he said, what's your Instagram? And I said it. And he said, what's your Facebook? And I said it. And he said, what's your Snapchat? And I said, I am a 43-year-old man. <laughs> 
The only 43-year-old men on Snapchat are definitely pedophiles. Right? Why else would they be there? And he didn't laugh at all. And I, I've got this really bad habit where when someone doesn't laugh at my joke, I always lean into it. So I said, you know that show To Catch a Predator in the US where they basically catfish pedophiles? Yeah. I said, the next season of To Catch a Predator should be they literally just go up to adult men in the street and say, what is your Snapchat handle? And, and if they have one... Fucking immediately throw them in the van. He's giving it a trial, right? Yeah. Anyway, this guy didn't laugh at all. I later I was a bit puzzled by that, so I Googled him. He is a 50-year-old man who is quite active on Snapchat. So oh, yeah. my, my bar for all interviews now is I aim to not accidentally accuse the interviewer of being a paedophile <laughs> in the course of talking to them. So I'm very pleased that we passed this this yeah. bar, but um, I, I will now accidentally call you paedophiles just to, to have fun. But, the, um, but, the, um, but yeah, I'm really moved by this conversation and uh, I really, I'm really moved by all of you, you know, by uh, how... It sounds like an ironic compliment to say thank you for paying attention to it, but you know what I mean? Like, I feel really really um, moved by it. Let's all go for a drink when I'm in Australia next year. Please. Seriously, yes. <laughs> Please, no phones. Hooray. Yeah, great. We love you, Johan. Thank you so much. Hooray. Thank, thank you, you, Johan. Oh, thank you so much. 